Growing up, only thing I knew about Okoye was that we didn't go there. Nobody said why, and I just assumed growing up it was just a town for white people. A lot of the specifics and the events of the Okoye massacre, we don't know. It was a horrible, horrible event. African Americans were slaughtered, were driven out of Okoye for decades. Okoe was a rural community that would have been pretty familiar to people living in Central Florida at the time, in the late 19th and early 20th century. And it was, you know, a community lined with orange groves and agricultural productions, and it was near Orlando, which was a transportation hub. The railroad came through Orlando. Farmers in Okoe could go to Orlando and send their goods to market. And so it had a very um, desirable place, just geography, because it was so close to a railroad hub. Citrus was the king. And July Perry, being that he was a labor broker for both black and white, he ruled. Some people said that he was not, you know, they said that he was meaner than a junkyard dog. So he probably had to be tough, being that things were the way they were. And to accomplish what he was accomplishing, there on the shores of Lake Apopka, everything was hustling and bustling here, and it was all about success, black or white, success. They're living in an era of Jim Crow, of segregation, of enforced segregation. They're living in an era when these men in Okoe, and by 1920, the women too, were full citizens of the United States, had the right to vote. But since the last decade of the 19th century, there have been active efforts to suppress the vote by violence and intimidation. It's suppressed by law. So there was a great deal of anxiety on the part of white supremacists in Florida to curb the number of African Americans who were going to vote in the 1920 election. So much so that in Orlando, in Lake City, and Jacksonville, days before the November election in 1920, the Ku Klux Klan marched through the downtown in those places specifically to intimidate African Americans from going out and casting a vote in that 1920 election. Judge John Cheney, who was gonna run for the Senate seat, courted the black vote. He helped July Perry and Mose Norman become registered voters. They paid their poll tax because back then you had to pay your poll tax. July Perry and, and Mose Norman, who were better economically situated in Okoe, push people to register to vote. And if they don't have the money for the poll tax, they will give them the money for the poll tax to register and vote. Mose Norman, you know, went to the polls in Okoe to vote. A scuffle starts and he leaves. And I guess he go by and tell July Perry, you know, I'm out of here because by now he's been attacked. And so the Ku Klux Klan, it was said, went to the home of July Perry. From there, all hell broke loose. He tells his family to flee. Who kills who? Nobody knows. Two whites end up dead in July Perry's backyard. You know, news of this gets out and a white mob comes to July Perry's house, armed. And of course, this leads to the Okoe massacre. You have 30 to 60 people that we think died there. It's painful. It's horribly painful to think about being in a situation where people are shooting at you and have set your house on fire and you're trying to escape in the dark of the night. Alan Franks' uncle was July Perry. Alan Franks was a refugee or survivor of the Okoy massacre. He knew the perimeters of the Lake Apopka. And Alan, who had to carry his sibling who 
had a physical illness through the swamps. You know, I just can't even imagine the pain, the fear of trying to get to a safe place. And July Perry taken from Okoye. Some say he was near death before he left Okoye, that he had been wounded and allegedly tied behind a vehicle and drug into Orlando. He was locked in the jail, wounded, near death. The vigilante group came to the jail and took him away. And they hung him in the vicinity of where Judge Cheney would see his body. And as a reminder to Judge Cheney, this is what happens when you register people to vote. It was reported very broadly, in fact. Um, the Florida newspapers were reporting it the next day, and then national newspapers took it up. In that wide reporting, it is reported from a white perspective, and a white perspective that, that sees the horror in the two white men who died. There are reports, I mean, you know, that the town was burned, but the implication often is that that's the fault of, of blacks, that the town burns down. The African-American accounts of Okoe lived with the people who experienced them initially. The ones who fled, they went to places like Apopka, went to places north or other parts of the south, and they shared those stories with their descendants who passed those stories on and on. And this is not unusual with racial terror in these ways. What African-Americans did in 1920 and soon after was just seed the story that could be germinated later, which future historians were able to do. Coy suffered greatly after 1920. Who's going to work over there? Not black people from those who knew. So for a long time, the economy suffered all because of people wanting to vote. I grew up in Apopka during the 50s. We, you know, we would not go through what was called the, you know, downtown Okoye. But no one ever said that people actually died there. It's just that it was a place that black people did not go. I became a member of Democracy Forum in 1997. I was invited to join a group by a friend of mine. Little did I know it was about what had happened in Okoye. And once I learned what they were doing, I was all in then. I'm going, oh wow, this is interesting. The constituency of Democracy Forum was quite diverse. You had a melting pot of people who were all on the same cause to inform people and come up with a way to reconcile. And we all had an assignment, pretty much to bring back information. We spent hours and weeks and months researching. Key pieces of the evidence of our research was the death certificate of July Perry, the census list of 1910, 1920, showing close to 300 black people living in Okoye. Then there was a letter from a woman by the name of Annie Hammeter this letter had been smuggled out of the community and it was describing uh, what type of citrus she was shipping to this friend in Ohio. She drops down in the second paragraph and she says, one of the most wickedest things has happened. Blacks are being forced to leave, you know, Okoye. It has been a journey, it's been an experience. One that has created an ongoing dialogue among many people now. And once we located descendants and they could trust us and they didn't seem to have that fear anymore, they would start sharing the stories of their descendants about what happened, the land they owned and where it was located. And, you know, they, they, it was like a freedom. We donated our research materials, which consist of thousands of documents. We donated that to the Orange County Regional History Center. And they're going to do an exposition in honor of the 100 years. And that is just so 
I'm so happy. A marker was placed in downtown Orlando uh, near the Orange County Regional History Center, which honors those who died as a result of lynchings. Now there's a petition to name a highway in the honor of July Perry, which is so honorable to know that it's being embraced now and that someone is telling the story. And for you know the memorial that is Okoy itself, been a long time coming. You know, there were years you couldn't say the Okoe Massacre in Central Florida at all. And now we have markers, we have a tombstone for July Perry, we have a curriculum going into our classrooms that will teach this throughout Florida. For African Americans, this is a really important milestone to, to sort of get it out there because their history and the history of Florida was whitewashed for, for so many decades. Adding to the Florida curriculum, discussions on Okoe and explorations of the history of Okoe, I think is a very important step for Florida. It means essentially that the next generations will know what Okoe was, will remember Okoe, will at some level deal with Okoe. I have met so many people in these last 22 years that you know, Francina, hmm, <laughs> what, how did you get in the middle of this? It was a calling. It was a calling. And you don't question your calling. <laughs>